G'day guys, welcome back to Supercoach with DR and welcome to the Round 5 Stock Market video. A Wednesday afternoon upload which is a little bit different, I apologise for that, just been super busy. A big week in Supercoach, we obviously had Jordan Ridley go down with concussion, that's really hurt Jordan Ridley owners. On a positive note in our back lines, we do have Lockie Jones, it's finally on the bubble. He looks like a pretty solid rookie option for us this year. Mansell as well, if you've already got Jones and you went early on him last week, he's another option for 102K in our back line. Talk a little bit more about him in a moment. Bo McCreary is another option we've got at 117K in our forward lines. Or are you looking to upgrade this week? Are you ballsy enough to bring in Lockie Neal after one good performance? I'll also discuss the Lockie Neal pick when we get to our premium midfielders. But I will keep the intro pretty short. We'll get straight into it. Let's take a look at the 500k plus defenders. The man at the top of the 500k plus defender list this week is Tommy Stewart, 536,300. Now with a season average of 109 and a really healthy three-round average of 117. His break-even's gone all the way down to 58. And if he can hit his projected score of 109 then he'll rise over 20k for this week. I've actually got the buy now on him. There's a couple of reasons why. The first reason is that he's got a lot of avenues to score. So he takes some of the kickouts. He's an attacking defender involved in scoring chains and also an intercept defender as well. Lots of intercept possessions, which really boosts up his score. And the second thing is that he's got a really, really high floor. So not the biggest ceiling usually, that was great over the weekend and something that we don't see too often from Tommy Stewart. We've seen it from time to time, but you can usually rely on Stewart to go probably 85 to 110 on most occasions, I think. So that's why I've got the buy now on Tommy Stewart. I wouldn't call him a pod. I think he's maybe high 20s in regards to ownership. But if you are looking for a premium defender for any reason, I think he could go a lot worse than Tommy Stewart. The next bloke under him, Daniel Rich, 532,800. Brought his name up a couple of weeks ago as a pod that may have some potential. So if you look at that three-round average, in great form, 115, and an average of 106 for the season. So break-even of 90, projected score of 106, looking to go up just over 5K there, 7,200. Certainly a pod, but do you trust him? Look, I think that you can trust him for a pretty consistent, reliable score. He's gone 72, so not a great round one, but then a 113, 122, 99, and a 123. So there's some really consistent scoring there. Basically gone over the ton the last four weeks, 99, giving one more point and he gets the three figures. So takes 52% of the kickouts, but strangely only 22% over the weekend, with Birchall taking 56% of the total kickouts last week. So... Daniel Rich, I do like him as a pod. Does he finish top six? Maybe top 10? Got a decent chance, I think. So if you're looking for a pod going out of the box, Danny Rich could be your man. Luke Ryan was impressed with this bloke over the weekend. Thought he played a really solid game. Lots of disposals and just got involved. I just didn't think that he was getting too involved over the first three to four weeks. But he's really hit back. An average now for the season of 102, a three-round average of 108. So again, one of the informed defenders in the comp at the moment, and certainly a pod selection still as well. Sam Doherty, 510,800. I was wrong on this bloke, I think, giving him the trap symbol, because if you look at that three-round average in the season average, 105, 99, certainly not too bad, and in better form than some of the other premiums that we see here over the last three weeks. Break even of 92, I don't think he'll make too much. I don't think he'll lose too much. Personally, I'm not in really interested in the Doherty pick myself. But you may be. Go for it if you want to, I think. But yeah, not for me. Jaden Short, 522,200. A really disappointing score over the weekend from Short. I had the buy now on him for the last couple of weeks. And I think that was for good reason. Hooley in the side... I don't think he's necessarily affected him too much. Certainly took a few of the kickouts, but the Richmond defensive unit as a whole didn't score well over the weekend. Gave the Saints an absolute belting, so I think Shorty should be right and bounce back to form. But if not Nona, maybe just watch him for the next week just to make sure Hooley isn't having a massive influence on him. Rory Laird, he's been pretty disappointing, to be quite honest. Three-round average of 98, season average of 103, which isn't too bad, but... I'd him pegged, almost locked, to be in the top two defenders by the end of the season. Actually, along with the Seagull, who we'll talk about in a little bit. But there's been another man, Jordan Ridley, 
Oh, yeah, spewing about Ridley. But, uh, yeah, the, the Laird pick, if you didn't start with Laird, it would have actually been okay. And pre-season, if you hadn't started Laird, I would have said you, you're absolutely crazy. He's just a must-have, an absolute no-brainer. But, yeah, at this stage, hasn't set the world on fire. A little bit disappointed with Rory, but hopefully he can come back. He's got the potential and the talent to do so, I think. Cal Mills, well... After that round one score, was it a 150 plus? I think it might have been a 150 plus. He's really come back down to earth. So now a three round average of 93, a break even of 137. That's getting higher and higher each week. So probably will lose cash in the short term. Now, I wouldn't be trading out Callum Mills for any reason. But at the same time, I probably wouldn't be investing in him at this stage either. I'd give him another couple of weeks and maybe reassess, I think. Now, Dan Houston, I believe he's a test for this week. So there may be news that comes out a little bit later in the week and get a better idea about whether or not Houston's going to be lining up. So if he does miss, I think it's only going to be very short term, maybe only this week. Given the fact he's listed as a test, that suggests that he's a chance to play. So I wouldn't assume he'd be out for too long. So certainly don't invest, but I wouldn't be trading either. The Seagull... Well, for the first time in a long time, under 600k and a pretty hefty break even of a 154. So if he goes close to that projected score, 95 to 100, he'll be going down around 25k. So yeah, you don't look to invest in him at the moment. But if you're a non-owner, then I think I said this last week, you'll be able to get him at a really decent price. So a season average of 107, still right up there with the top defenders. That three round average, Again, sort of mid-range there. So I still like the Seagull pick. Do I regret starting with him? No, still not at this stage. I think that is a good selection. But as a non-owner, you'd be really happy that you can jump on him soon. Now, Jordan Ridley, wowee, you just can't plan for this sort of stuff. Down to 588,900 after looking to go probably mid-600s. Average of 113 for the season now. Again, that's gone right down and a three-round average of only 101. So look at that break even. Very much in the red, 190. I didn't think that we'd see this all season. Durability wasn't a major concern for me, but with these concussion incidents, you know, an Aaron Talbo from Eric Kipwood, yeah, you just can't plan for it. So really, really disappointing that he won't be able to line up this week. His health is obviously our main concern for first and foremost. But yeah, as a super coach owner, it hurts so much. And Nod Ridley owners, you have a really, really big leg up here. And uh, yeah, luck's gone your way, I think, with Jordan Ridley. But in regards to do you trade, do you hold, I've got to hold with an exclamation mark there. Don't think about trading out Jordan Ridley. Look, do you trade him out if you're facing a donut? I still wouldn't. I'd still look to do something else involving another player or another combo somewhere. I just wouldn't look to get rid of Ridley because unless he really feels those effects, I suppose, of his concussion for the next month, and look, some players have in the past. We've heard many, many stories, particularly from past and previous players, but that's the only reason I think that his scoring will start to go on a downward tra trajectory. Sorry. Apart from that, there is absolutely no reason I see him not continuing to rise up and up. So for non-owners, jump on him. Uh, so not this week. He's obviously not playing. Not next, not next. So another three to four weeks, you can jump on Jordan Ridley. And geez, you'll be able to get him at a really, really good price. Depending on what he scores when he comes back, it's hard to project that. But if he gets 122, like it's got there. And again, this is a different projection for a different week because this obviously takes into account the venue that he's playing at, the opponent he's coming up against. So that projected score may change next week. But if we use this as an example, he'll go down 30K the next week that he plays. So, yeah, frustrating as an owner, wonderful as a non-owner. On to the defenders, 250 to 500K. As you can see, I'm not a huge fan of many of these blokes at all. So Marcus Adams, I think he's a trap, mainly due to his durability. Plays that key defensive role as well. So... Will be a real roller coaster, I think, in regards to his average. Lockie Scholl, I am actually a fan of this bloke, and you cannot deny that three round average of 114. The season average is almost on the 100 at the moment, so if there's anyone on this list that I think 
can give the top 10 a little bit of a shake, then I think it may be Lockie Scholl. I'm not 100% convinced on this pick, but look, if you're looking for an ultra pod, you could go for Scholl. He's looking to rise 43K this week if he can hit a projected score of 94. So we'll be at the 500 mark if he manages to do that by the end of round six. If you want to go there, you can. I just wouldn't be ballsy enough to do it myself. Heath Chapman, now the ship has certainly sailed now. Do not look to invest in Chapman. As an owner, I was really happy with what he's produced over the last couple of weeks. Underscored, I feel, over the weekend. Look, I really did only watch the first half and bits and pieces of the second half. But from what I saw, yeah, that looked like a much better game than a mid fifty score. I think it was 56 in the end that he received. But yeah, don't look to jump on him, but certainly don't look to trade him. He's got a little bit more money to make. And when I say a little bit more, hopefully he can go past that 300 mark. That'd be really nice. Lockie Young, 293,600. Still with a fairly low break even, so just keep in at the moment. Bonner, I think, is a trap. Just not a fan of him. Buckley, you can keep a watch on him. Lockie Ash, as a little bit of a pod, he actually took out a lot more of the kickouts on the weekend. So, yeah, look, oh, I couldn't go there as well. But at 404,000, if he works out, he's got a three-round average of 97. And we've seen that from someone like Rory Laird. So, it's certainly... Not a bad average 97 for a three-rounder, but I think it's just too much of a risk for myself. Cox, yeah, pretty bad score of the weekend. Conditions weren't great for a big man like Cox, although he's good, you know, below his knees. 289,000. Look, he's not on the chopping block, I don't think, with a break-even of 34. That's why I said that the ship had sailed. It was either last week or the week before because he's got those two really nice scores, but... We've seen that he's got a really low floor as well and a couple of scores in the 30s. So he's a bit of a raffle. I think a little bit similar to a Jordan Butts who's done a little bit the same. Some good scores and then some pretty average scores. So keep him at this stage, but he may be on the chopping block soon, I think. Jordan Clark is definitely on the chopping block. Look, he's not a must trade. I haven't got the sell button on him, but I think given the fact he was the medical sub, I had my heart in my mouth, as I said in my round review, because I had the emergency on Butts and Clark on field, so I really dodged a bullet there. But the last thing that we want is for Clark to be the medical sub, come on even halfway during the game, even worse, late in the game as that medical sub, score 6 to 10 points, and his price will start to absolutely plummet. So the good thing this week is that he does play one of the early games, so hopefully we'll have some information on him before we need to make some other crucial decisions in our side. But for me personally, Clark is going out this week, and I'll be replacing him with, would I call him a must-have rookie? I'd say certainly the best rookie buy this week anyway. Hunter Clark, a little bit of a pod there. Worked out okay, but not great. Darcy Byrne-Jones, a bit of a pod. Had a nice score over the weekend, but yeah, I think he's pretty much got trap written all over him. And McGovern, the three-round average of 104 looks pretty nice. Average of 91. I wouldn't look to trade him in. I had him, it was two or three years ago. And look, he's got a decent ceiling, you know. He can have some really, really big games. But then he can have some stretches where he's just terrible. In regards to his scoring, anyway. He can still have an impact, but for super coach, yeah, not my type of guy. Brody Smith, one of the informed defenders in the comp at the moment with a three-round average of 114, a season average of 94. Got a really low break even this week for that three-round average of 41, projected score of 98. So if he can go near the ton, he'll rise over 25K. Do I like him as a selection? Not really. I'm always a little bit worried about the Brody Smith selection, but you can't deny that recent form. Took 65% of the total kick-ins last week. So, as a pod selection, if you want to go really different, you can, but I wouldn't highly recommend it, personally. Liam Duggan, well, didn't he make me look silly last week, having the trap symbol on him basically all year? Went around the 140 mark from memory, and at 448,000, you look at that game last week, and you may think, let's jump on this bloke, but... I'm still keeping the trap symbol there. It is only one game. He's been ultra disappointing in every other appearance this year. So for owners, really nice that he has finally repaid the faith. I've said to jump on him for the last couple, but with a three-round average of 104, 
break even of 42. Even with a score around the 80s, he'll still look to make some short-term cash there. So 86, and he'll go up around 20K. But I still think he's a bit of a trap. Certainly do not look to jump on. You have to see at least one more big game or something special from Duggan, in my opinion, to want to bring him into your side. Jordan Butts, 262,600. Really nice game on the weekend. I had him as my emergency, as I said before when I was talking about Jordan Clark. But uh, in the short term, if he can go around the 60, he'll make 8K. It really does depend on what he scores this week because the pattern's been one good score, one poor score, one good, one bad. And that really halts that cash generation. So he went above 80 last week. If he can go anywhere around a 75 plus that will be fantastic for his cash generation and that break break even sorry it will be even lower next week so i'm a happy butts owner and not looking to trade him out maybe in the next couple depending on how he goes but he's a wait and see at this stage butts blake hardwick so just throwing him out there as a bit of a different option i can see now that i've got the wrong symbol on him there i was meant to have the binoculars on Hardwick, just as a bit of a pod, a nice score over the weekend, an average of 95. He'll make a little bit of cash, but I can't recommend him, just throwing a different name out there. Now, the 90% kick in rate, that should have been down below with Alex Witherden. I do have the star on him there, projected rise to be announced because he has only played the one game. Shannon Hearn's gone out, Alex Witherden has come in. So I assume that role taking basically all of the kick outs, as you can see there. Now, if he was guaranteed to keep this role, he would be a fantastic selection, in my opinion. But what's going to happen when Shannon Hearn returns to the side? We know that they love him kicking the ball out because he can kick it long, he can kick it accurately. Witherden is also renowned for his kicking as well. I know at Brisbane, he tended to try to bite off, not the impossible, but put it this way, there was an easier option at times and he decided not to go with that option. I don't think it was showing off. I think that he's got the skills to be able to pull off those type of kicks, but every now and then, I think he overdid it a little bit at times. Uh, a little bit slow, I think, with Eden. That was another knock on him during his time at Brisbane, but a year or two ago, he did hire a running coach, so he is a type of bloke that has been working hard on some of his deficiencies, and I think the price that West Coast got with Eden for was an absolute steal. So, yeah, concerns are... When Shannon Hearn, come, Hearn sorry, comes back, what happens with Witherden? Does he take the kickouts? Do they go 50-50? They'll probably still look to get it in his hands if he's in the side, but they'll still look to get it in Hearn's hands as well. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens there. I can't predict it. So look, see how he goes this week. Assess how long Hearn's going to be out for. You could make some short-term cash. Look, if he goes another 130 plus next week, then he'll be making some really, really nice cash. And it's not going to be anything like a Tex Walker move because you're getting him around a 300k mark. You're already paying up a decent price for Alex Witherden around that mid 450s. But we'll talk about him a lot more next week when he's played his second game. Tommy Duday, durability just always a concern there. Harris Andrews, a bit of a pod. I wouldn't go there myself. Fantasia, I think it's almost time for him to be on the chopping block. If you look at that break even, it's now in the red in regards to his three round average by negative 14 and even one below his season average. So if he goes to 60, he's only going to lose you close to 2k. But yeah, if you're looking for someone to downgrade, he could be your man, I think, depending on if you got him in the defensive line and your forward. Yeah, you could also keep on to him because... He's not a first or second year rookie. But personally, I think he's someone that you could look to trade. Sard is a pod, not really interested. Lever, just throwing another name out there because he does have a three-round average of 107, similar to Harris Andrews with 106 there. And Isaac Cumming, 56% of the kick-ins last week. That average of 88, break-even of 69. That's starting to get closer. I don't think that Cumming is going to be a keeper. So probably in a couple of weeks, you may look to upgrade him or downgrade him, depending on where you want to go there. Now we can start to see some of these break-evens well in the red. So we'll start with the man CJ up the top. Pretty disappointing score from him over the weekend. Didn't have a huge impact on the game, but 
When he did have a slight impact, I actually think that he got scored pretty well and was lucky to score what he did, which was a low to mid 70s score. So if you're a CJ owner, the question is, is this bloke going to be a keeper? We're still not sure at the moment. That three round average of 100, yeah, fantastic. Average on the season of 97, that's looking okay. But can he keep it up? He has not had any history of premium scoring or even reliable scoring. He's really burst out of the blocks this year, CJ. So I'd be a slightly concerned if I was an owner. But again, if you got him in nice and early, or even if you started with him, you're still laughing at this stage. If you got him in in the last one to two weeks, then you may be slightly concerned if he gets another 70-odd score this week because that will really halt that cash generation and obviously raise the questions whether or not he's even a keeper. Dougal Howard, the seagull, not really interested in him. Maynard's hit a little bit of form, but nothing spectacular. You'd have to see a lot more before considering bringing him into your side. Zach Williams, durability, always a concern. Christian Salem had a decent game over the weekend, but that break-even, still over that three-round average, probably no reason to bring him into your side. But over the weekend, did take 67% of the kick-ins, which was a high percentage for him. Jack Lukosius, a little bit of a different role over the weekend. Still think he's a trap though, but will he affect this man, Jack Bowes? Last week was looking absolutely spectacular. Or when I say last week, the week before, lots of kicks. We know that. We talked about that in last week's stock market video. But unfortunately this week, that possession count was right down. Look, the Dog Zero is a tough side to come up against, but... I wouldn't lose faith with Bose at the moment, but the value is it there. If you look at that three round average, it's only 92. So the break even is in the red now by 18 plus. So he was looking to score 107, go down about 1200 if that's the case. Look, he'll probably hover around that mark for a little while, I think, Bose. Jack Crisp, 496,000. Not really interested in this pick. A pod, terrible buy though. The helmet, he comes back this week. Will be really interesting to see how he fits into the side. Does he even come back? I think so. But if you kept on to him, you're hoping for a really solid return. And if you did trade him, you're hoping that he goes absolutely terribly. Stephen May, we can't bring him in. But I think that you do have to sell him. I think he's three plus weeks away. Maybe only three weeks away. But with the carnage down there at the moment, it's pretty tough to hold someone like a May when we've got other players like Ridley, for example, that are out in the short term. It's just so hard to have someone like May sitting on the pine at that price for the next three weeks. So I'd be trading him personally, but if you haven't got any problems down there and you're pretty safe, maybe you've got some DPP swing, for example, then I suppose you could keep him. But for me, I'd be booting him out. And the defenders under 250K, there's a little bit of action here. We can see that there's a few players that are actually on the bubble. So we'll start with Tommy Highmore. I would hold. I'm hoping that he gets a chance this week. Saints played terribly last week. So he's looking to make 60K if he can go around that projected score of 69. So give him a few more weeks. If you're desperate to get rid of him after that, and it's not looking likely that he's going to get in any time soon, then he could reevaluate that decision and sell if needed. But at this stage, certainly hold on to Tommy Highmore. Lockie Jones, I rate him as the best buy this week. So he's a fan favorite already. The mullet, the mo, we love that. An average of 65, negative break even of 48. If he can hit that average, then he'll go up 50K. I think his job security is pretty good. He's shown with that 65 average over the first two rounds that he does have some okay scoring potential that floor should not be too low the ceiling i don't think will be overly high but we're hoping that jones will get better and better with each game he'll throw a bad score in every now and then and i think that he's got the potential to go on 80 plus also but for this week out of all the options here i think he's the safest and the best buy but if you're looking to take jones ahead of someone like a mantle like i am you are forking out an extra 37k and 37k i know in my side at the moment could do absolute wonders but i just rate the jones pick ahead of the mansell pick but with mansell look i don't really know about his job security but i do know he's got a bit of mongrel about him it's a choice of him or jones for most as i said 
He is the cheaper option, but I just don't like this pick near as much as I like the Jones pick. If you selected Jones last week, went a little bit early on him, you could look to get Mansell in your side, but I'm assuming most people have Tommy Highmore, so it's a little bit of a risk, I think, getting Mansell at that D7 position, D8, depending on how you view him and Highmore. But if you run with both of them, I think that's a little bit risky because I'm not sure about his medium-term job security, Mansell. I'm not even sure about his short-term job security. But at 102000 he is bargain basement price, an average of 47. It's not too bad for that price. Negative break even, as we can see. If he can get that average, he'll go up 35K. So on the bubble this week, an option, I think, if you don't have Jones, oh, sorry, if you do have Jones, and possibly an option if you're making another trade this week to pair up with the Mansell trade, and that 37K that you can save can allow you to go up to the premium player that you really, really want. So depending on your situation, uh, certainly rate James Jones, sorry, is a better pick. Lewis Young, don't know a heap about this player, to be quite honest, but on the bubble, but when you're paying close to 300K, it's just not what you're looking for. Jackson Pryor, I'm a Lions supporter, obviously. I think that he's got a pretty bright future ahead of him, but it's his job security that I'm really concerned about. He's certainly on the fringe Nowhere near cemented in our best 22. You've got blokes like Kitty Coleman that's not getting a game at the moment. And a few other fellas, such as your Dev Robertsons, that also got admitted last week. So, prior, it'll be interesting to see how he goes in the short term. But I wouldn't recommend him as a really good trading pick. Better options. I'd go for Mansell, I think, ahead of prior. Kaczynski, well, I've got the snail and the fire there. A new symbol. That's a slow burn. So... He'll continue to make a little bit of money. His break-even's only 9. Projected score of 44, which is close to that. Well, it is exactly on that average there. He'll go up about 15k. But, yeah, I've got big concerns that he's going to go past the 210 mark. If he gets one good game, that's all we need from Cozzy. But, again, if he continues to throw in some 30s and some other stinkers, then that cash generation is just going to be halted and it's going to be tough to make a quick buck off him this year, I think. And Burgess, I think, is a trap. You're already paying over 200k, 237,100. With an average of 61, you want a lot more than that to be paying that amount, and I think he's a trap. So in summary, keep on high more. Get Jones into your side, I think, if you haven't got him. Jordan Clark's, I think, a really good option. I know he's a highly owned player, so that'll be a lot uh, an option, sorry, for lots of us, and then probably Mansell after that. On to the midfielders, 500k and over. My man, Huey McCluggage, finds himself at the top of the list this week at a price of 518000 Season average of 97, an improved three-round average of 110. Low break even of 60. If he can hit a projected score of 93, which is four off his season average, he'll rise about 15k. Certainly a pod selection this year. There's a reason why they call this bloke the Rolls-Royce. I think he can be one of the most damaging midfielders in the competition in the next couple of years. We know that he's been all Australian quality in the midfield on the wing. Didn't quite make the, the final team, but certainly in the squad for two years. He is absolutely elite, but it's that consistency that lets Huey down. Can have some really big games, but then can have some of those quieter games. And particularly when you are playing that role on the wing, it's not as easy to score as when you're playing more of that inside midfield role. But Huey is spending more and more time on the inside, and I'm hoping that sooner rather than later, given the fact that we've got some other guys in the team that I think can possibly play that wing role, that Huey finds himself attending more and more centre bounces as the years go on. So probably a you no know from me, as a trading option, but certainly a pod. And, well, from a Brisbane Lions supporter and someone that's a massive fan of Huey, I hope that he goes really, really well. David Mundy, I do have the trap with question marks. Look, I need to pay some respect to this man. I should have probably found or created an old man symbol. I'll do that for him next week, Dave Mundy, to give him a bit more respect. Or is it more disrespectful of the old man symbol? I'm not too sure. But you can't deny his form. A three-round average of 117. The season average of 112. This man is playing out of his skin. And I don't think many people saw this coming. But 
at his age. I just think that it's too much of a risk to bring him into your side. Christian Petrarca, he's hit some form recently with a three-round average of 112 over a, an overall season average of 105. A low break even of 84, so definitely in the green there. And look, he's been a bit of a disappointing selection for those that started him. But if you didn't start with this guy in your side, it's time to take a really, really close look. Personally, I'd like to give him at least one more week, even though that break-even is low and he'll most likely go up in price. If he doesn't go absolutely bananas, he'll probably go up around the 10K mark. But there's still a few question marks for mine. There's been a lot of talk, particularly over the, last, over the first three to four rounds, that maybe the new rules don't suit him. The longer quarters, is that testing out his durability? But I think that midfielders that can be damaging up forward are worth their weight in gold and Petraka is that man so I still think that he can be a really good selection this year do you bring him in now well with a break even of 84 you certainly could but my personal opinion is that I just want to see a little bit more before I commit close to 600k for him Nat Fife, well, I'm always going to be worried about his durability. I love Fife as a player. He's a super scorer, and usually for season average, he's right up there. But you'll find for overall points that he's generally not in the top 10, and that's always a concern. But if I don't have him in the side, which I won't early on, I can guarantee you that, I'll look possibly to get him in if I've got an injury, maybe in the midfield, if there's six or less rounds to go. I'll, I think that minimizes the risk a lot rather than starting with him. So he's always an option, but probably later on in the season for mine. Trelaw as well. Durability, just such a big concern with this bloke. Been playing well. Can't deny that form with a three-round average of 114, but not for me. The Bond I'd be much more interested in than Adam Trelaw. The Bond's got a season average of 114 over Trelaw's 100 average. With the Bond, and I've said this many times, He's got the, the potential to go really, really big, you know, 170 type scores. And then he can have a bit of a lean patch where he goes close to that 80 mark. So I'm hoping at some stage he does have a bit of a lean patch and then jump on him then. Jaeger O'Meara, well, durability, always a major concern. But a three-round average of 118, that's right up there with the best in the competition. So you can't deny that, but the risk is too big in my opinion. Jack McRae, a must-have. Get him in sooner rather than later. He's not going to be going down in price anytime soon. A projected score of 127, a break-even of 98 in the green. Yeah, get him in when you can. And it's absolutely killing me not having this guy on my side. I'll go through a few stats in a minute when I compare him to another player. Lockie Neal. So the Brownlow medalist from 2020 has finally hit some form, a 150-plus score over the weekend. Those that kept on to Neil would be absolutely over the moon, wrapped and hoping that that form continues. Does that form continue? Do we buy him now? Well, I can't answer those questions, but what I can say is this. You need to take into account the fact that Lockie Neal is now training properly, and apparently the news out of Brisbane was that he trained fully for the first time this week, for the whole preseason, that's a really, really good sign. We know that he's got premium history of being able to score like this, as I mentioned before, on a consistent basis. And these are all good things. The Lions finally look like they've hit a little bit of form. Back at the Gabba, fantastic. Obviously down in Melbourne this weekend against Carlton. So they're all really positive signs about the Lockie Neal trade in this week. However, I do have some concerns. Firstly, we need to analyse the game over the weekend. The conditions, they really suited Lockie Neal. No disrespect to Essendon, but we came up against some pretty weak opposition. He did not receive a hard tag, and when he did cop some attention, it was from first-year player Archie Perkins, so probably more of a lesson for Perkins rather than anything. So that does concern me. So my personal preference is to wait one more week on Neal, See how he goes against arguably better opposition away from home and coming up against a much more able tagger in Ed Kurnow. He's done a pretty good job over the years, Ed Kurnow, so I do rate him as a tagger, and it'll be interesting to see how Neil handles that. But at the same time, 
He's training fully now, or reportedly training fully, which are really, really good signs for Neil and the Lions in general. So if you want to get him this week, you can. But personally, I would just wait one more, just to make sure that this wasn't just a flash-in-the-pan score against a pretty weak club. And Sam Walsh, I'm spewing that I don't have an extra 20 to 40k to be able to bring this bloke in. He looks like a top 10 mid, and that was my prediction pre-season, so should have trusted my gut and starred him, but certainly looks like a solid option this week, and you may not be able to get him under 600k in a couple of weeks if he keeps his form up. He seems pretty consistent, which is nice, and if I had the money, this bloke would make his way into my side. I think that he's got a nice role. The only concerns that I've probably got with Walsh is the fact that he hasn't really clopped any close attention as of yet. And I think if he's pumping out scores like 144 and playing like he did on the weekend on a consistent basis, then opposition teams will start to shut him down. And I don't think that he's ever really had to deal with too much close attention before. I'll have to look into his history. Unfortunately, as I said, I can't get him this week. So I've got a little bit of time up my sleeve to be able to do that. Because even if it's not this week, still definitely an option for me and we may have to pay up for him but I think it may be worth it depending on how he goes over the next two to three weeks anyway for me but love the Sam Walsh selection and think there's a good good chance that he can finish in the top 10 for averages by season's end and Clary he's just a must-have 591,600 I made a video a play review video on Clary pre-season I said he's an absolute lock an absolute must-have I outlined a lot of the reasons why, and it's all about that contested ball, clearances, and tackles. He's rated elite in those three categories over the last three years. That's what he builds his game off. We know that he roves to Max Gorn, the best ruckman in the competition. Great synergy between the two of those blokes. So I think that he is an absolutely fantastic buy this week with a break-even of 101, a projected score of 108. I think that he can go above that 108 mark. And I'm hoping as an owner anyway, that he can go 120 plus. So I'm a big advocate for the Clayton Oliver selection. I think he's a must have. And along with Jack McRae, Jack Steele, three definite must haves. And Lockie Neal, if he can continue this form, I think that he'll be close to a must have also. Zerit bounced back to form on the weekend, which is really good for me. 584,200. Season average is looking a lot better now at 109. His break even's 108, so won't go up or down too much this week, or it's not expected that he will. I wouldn't look to trade him in. I'd want to see a little bit more from Merritt. It's only been one really nice week. The others have been acceptable or barely acceptable at his starting price, hoping that he can just continue this Merritt. Cripper, I'm not an owner. A three-round average of 97, an average on the season of 92, I'm pretty sure that his average last season was 97. So it's looking at this stage that he's going to give you a similar output, which is probably not going to be enough to be a keeper in your midfield at this stage. Does he turn it around? Hopefully for owners, but I'd be leaning more towards no. Jared Lyons, I love this selection. 613,500. A three-round average of 127 and a really solid season average of 117. That's up there with the elites in the competition. Break even 118, so basically right on his season average. But they think he'll get a projected score of 129. So looking to go up a little bit if he can achieve that. A really nice pod selection, Jared Lyons. He's not going to get tagged like other stars such as Lockie Neal would. I just think that he's a solid selection. He has a really nice ceiling. And he's not going to go really, really low. He has in the past, but over the last couple of seasons, probably the last year and a half, that consistency has been a lot better from Lions. So don't expect too many low scores, and you'll get a monster from Lions every now and then. So really like him as a pod. Andrew Gaff, we need to see a little bit more from him. Been a little bit up and down, more down this season, not interested in him. Parker, he's been a really nice pod, 105 for an average, three round average of 113. Uh, pretty tough buy though in round 14 for Parker. Josh Kelly could even be on the chopping block because there's been so much talk about 
his role in the forward line. I'm not going to bore you with all that stuff because we've been hearing it for the last couple of weeks. Not a good selection. Josh Kelly at 539. It's really tempting just to keep the faith and hope that Cameron gets sacked pretty soon. Jack Steele, 655,000. I'm always going to have the buy now there on him because I think he's a must-have midfielder. I would prioritize McRae, certainly Oliver, if you don't have this week, if you don't have him, sorry, this week over Jack Steele. But if you're already stacked there with an Oliver, McRae, then Steele's okay to bring in. But you're paying up a little bit too much probably at the moment. But in saying that, his break even is right on his three round average. So nothing to suggest that he can't achieve that this week. So always going to be a solid selection, Jack Steele. And will finish, in my opinion, in the top handful of midfielders by season's end. Now, this man here, Titch. If you watch my round review video, you could tell how frustrated I was with this selection. So, here's some stats for you. So, round one, 39 possessions, 5 tackles, 135 points. Fantastic. Two free kicks against him there. And then in round two... I get him into the side because Dangerfield was suspended in round one. Need the replacement. He was at a really similar price point. And coming off that score, I thought, you little ripper, Titch is back. Then in round two, 37 touches, two tackles, only 109 points. You'd be expecting a lot more than that with 37 touches at the pill. Two free kicks against as well. Round three, that's when he played Geelong. Got the Mark O'Connor tag. I thought played pretty well through that tag. Three tackles, 24 possessions for 89 super coach points. Again, with two free kicks against. So average two free kicks against in the first three games. Game four, 38 possessions, two tackles, 107 points. 38 possessions for 107 points. Again, just not what we want. And then on the weekend... 32 touches of the pill, so pretty low, I suppose, for Titch's standards. Five tackles, really nice. 76 super coach points. Two free kicks against that you can add in there. So as an owner, I am just so, so frustrated. You compare that with someone like a Jack McRae. You know, 35 touches, seven tackles, 118. 41 touches with a 137. 33 for a 108. 32 for a 137, and 35 for a 146. So he's got three scores higher than Titch already after five rounds. So a much better pick, Jack McRae. Titch, 17 tackles on the year, but eight free kicks against for the year as well. 170 disposals, averages 10 contested a game compared to McRae, 176 disposals, 13 contested a game. And with Jack McRae, he kicks more, he uses it better, He's got more tackles, less free kicks against, more clearances. Clearly the much better pick. And when my opponents have Jack McRae and I'm sitting there with a titch, 32 disposal games, five tackles for 76 points, it's just not good enough and it is absolutely killing me. He is rated elite for disposals and uncontested possessions, but they're the only two categories at the moment that he is rating elite in. If you look back to his Brownlow year in 2017, he rated elite for tackles, pressure acts, clearances, contested possessions, uncontested possessions, even ground ball gets, all of those categories. But this stage of this year, only two categories, which is really uncontested disposal. So it's not a good pick at this stage. And if you're a non-owner, even though that price at 549 looks pretty tempting, I would not be bringing him into my side because it seems like this bloke needs to touch the pill 50, 60 times in order to go 125 plus. There's been that one game, as I said, 39 touches for 135 with the five tackles. But apart from that, been really mediocre score. His next best score is 109. And, you know, scores like 76, 89. I just can't have that for my midfield premium. So I've got no option other than to just keep the faith and hope that he turns good. But there's a lot of hope involved in that at this stage. On to the midfielders, 250 to 500k. As you can probably tell from the notes section there, I'm not a huge fan of any of these players. 
Tommy Powell, he's obviously a fantastic rookie that we started with, looking to rise by 36k if he can hit his projected score of 70. Keep on to this bloke, and hopefully he can get to 350k. If you get to 400, wouldn't that be amazing? Maybe a bit of a stretch, I think, but who knows? He has hit the ton already this season, so does have an okay ceiling. Josh Battle, look, I'm just throwing him in there as an absolute pod, a mid-forward, 359,000. Just wouldn't go there myself. Heppel, look, an average of 89, that's okay. But why are you bringing in someone at this price point? I don't see a reason why anyone would be doing it. Won't be the worst pick, but really doesn't make sense to me. Cal Ward, always worried about his durability. Threw Seedman, Seedsman sorry, in there just as a pod. Got to respect that 103 three-round average, but really, do we look to select Paul Seedsman in our midfield at 460k? Absolutely not. Jack Redden, the same as him, just a pod to throw out there. Tommy Green's turned out to be a trap this year. Brad Crouch, I think, will be a trap. Due to his durability, the NDHP policy, just not a selection that I'd look at Brad Crouch. Errol, he's still got some money to be made, but remember, that 20 grand projected price rise is based on him scoring 97 this week, which I'm not sure will happen. So let's say that's closer to the 60 mark. That rise isn't going to be anywhere near 20 grand, but he's continuing to go up, which is nice. When are we going to get rid of him? Maybe sooner, maybe later, because he is the type of guy that can hit 100 quite easily and the sort of player that you do want as a rookie on your field. Parfit as a pod, 96 for the season, looking to go up 7K. But again, we don't have any spots for these type of guys in the midfield. Same as Amon and same as Ellis. But you look at their three rounds average, 94 for Amon and 105 for Ellis. They're playing pretty well, these blokes. But my advice is just stay away from guys at this price point unless they're an absolute fallen premium. On to Andy McGrath. I've just got the watch on him. I think he's a bit of a trap. I wouldn't look to go near him, just throwing his name out there. Drew, I think you've got to sell. His job security all of a sudden has come into question. If his medical sub comes on late, that's going to kill his cash generation. So I'd be getting rid of him now before anything else goes wrong with him. Lockie Hunter's been an absolute trap. He started in the top 10 most expensive midfielders for 2021, which is just unbelievable, isn't it? But I did say pre-season when I was reviewing Hunter, I would be absolutely gobsmacked if he could go anywhere near what he averaged last year. Cunnington's a really interesting one. I've looked a bit into this pick, and I've come to the conclusion that he is a trap, I think. With an average of 83, we look at his age. Durability could still be a bit of a concern after those back issues last year. He's looking to lose money this week. It's a projected score of 66, which probably isn't generous enough, I think, for Cunnington. But if he does go around that projected score, losing about 14k, there's not a whole heap that I like about this pick. North as a side are absolutely terrible this year. Age is against him. Or but look, when I say age is against him, I've actually got the feeling I may be a little bit wrong there. I think he just looks a lot older than what he is. I'll have to actually find out how old. Ben Cunnington is, but yeah, you can probably tell by now, probably spent too much time on him, I just wouldn't look to select him. Selwood, again, age is not on his side, but had a ripper of a season so far. Taranto, you don't sell him, you don't buy him. Smith, I'd be tempted to almost have the trap on, because the Bulldogs, they're absolutely flying at the moment, but the points are getting shared really in that midfield between McRae, Dunkley, and the Bond, with Libra also coming through there, and some other players from time to time, but just don't look to get Smith into your side, I don't think, particularly in the midfield this year. LDU, absolute trap. Simpkin trap. Brayshaw. Now, this is a bloke that I do want to have a little bit of a chat about. So, he went from hero to zero from rounds one to four. Punched out a 125, 132, I think it was, in the first two. Then it was a 66 and a 48 in the next two. You know, a real young gun, up-and-coming type player, but didn't do too well with the tag. Will he bounce back this week against North Melbourne? They've probably got Turner that's going to come up against him. That break-even, 117. I certainly think that it's achievable. 
Now, for me, a decent trade option, but also a risky one. You know, is he a proven primo? Well, we saw what he did last year, and I was really impressed. I had him from the start of the season all the way up until the end of the season, and probably with Christian Petrucca, my best starting selection, Brayshaw, last year. But how is he going to handle that tag? I'm not too sure. He hasn't ha- handled it well in the first couple of rounds. Last week, didn't cop much attention. If any, just a usual tight matchup. He's got around 14 by. So, for me, I'm really tempted to bring him in. But it's still a risk. And when I'm bringing in players at this stage of the season, I don't want to be bringing in risky players. And I think that Brayshaw does have an element of risk to him. But at the same time, I think that he can present some awesome value. But I'm going to play it safe on this one. I'm going to wait a week. And look, my trade plans could change. But I'm looking to wait a week on Brayshaw. Just see if Turner does give him a little bit of grief. And look, if you can't cop a Turner tag, then I just won't be going near Brayshaw, I don't think. But if you can get through that okay, score pretty well then he's certainly a trading option, possibly next week for me. But again, I'll also get the opportunity to see how someone like a Lockie Neal goes and have the opportunity to go even higher than a Brayshaw. But a great value pick. If you need to upgrade this week and you've got the cash in the bank, then I think he's an okay selection. And Adam Chera, unfortunately, you've got to sell him. His break-even is now 129, but more importantly, he is injured and won't be back in action for a little while, I don't think. I think it's about a month. I think it's four weeks. So, look, you may choose to hold him there if you've got some really good rookie coverage. But four-plus weeks, when there's some other players that you could be getting around this price point, such as a Brayshaw, I think that option's probably too good to pass up. So if I'm a Chera owner, I'm probably trading this week. And the midfielders, under 250k. Not a lot to see here in regards to trade-ins. We can see Gyro there and Bruin, both with poor job security. Gyro looking to go at 44K, but not sure if he even plays. Lockie McNeil, Lazaro, Jordan, Phillips, and Berry, really. They've all got the same symbol there, apart from Berry, who I think may be on the chopping block a little bit sooner than the four that we see above him, but they're just going to be slow burns. McNeil... He only cost us 102k, so he's made 82 at the moment. We do want a lot more from him, though. Lazaro is going to be an extremely slow burn. If you look at that projected score, 31. His break even's up to 25. He'll struggle to get to 200k. James Jordan, a much better score from him on the weekend. Of course, it's the first week that I don't actually field him, and he gets his best score in the last three. But these things happen, I suppose. I'm keeping on to James Jordan. I do rate him as a player. We know that his time on ground roll hasn't been great lately. But if you can get back to what he did on the weekend, I'd be really happy with that and boost that average up, hopefully closer to a 70. But I'm holding at this stage. Will Phillips, you shouldn't have brought this bloke in. You shouldn't have started with him. So there's no reason why I don't think anyone would have Tom Phillips in their side, or Will Phillips, sorry. And Sam Berry, I do have the chop on him. Now... It's tough because at 213000 he hasn't made much money. But given the fact he scored so poorly on the weekend, that's really going to halt his cash generation. We know what type of a player he is. We all know by now. A tackling beast, not a huge accumulator. And the fact that he only laid one tackle on the weekend, yeah, that led to a really poor score. So I think that he does rely on those tackles to get to that 50-point mark. And without them, I think that he's going to struggle. So job security, I think, is good for Berry. He obviously came in for Matt Crouch. I'm not even sure when Crouch is looking to return to the side. If you need someone to trade out out of these blokes here, I'd probably look to trade out. It's tough because Lazaro is probably the biggest dud, apart from Bruin there. I'd go probably Lazaro, even though you haven't made any money. There may be some signs that, he can punch out a 50-60 type score, which would get that running a little bit. But probably, yeah, Lazaro or Berry are the main two for me. I won't include Phillips because not many of us have him. 
And I've got there coming soon, Finn McRae had a really good last quarter on the weekend. A bit of a quieter start to the game, but certainly found his feet as he went along and will be an extremely popular trading target for us next week. Trav Boak gone a little bit cold after a red-hot start to the season. He finds himself with a season average of 115, but only a three-round average of 98. So there's 17 points difference there, and that just goes to show that he's not been in great form recently. But he is the type of player that does have a decent ceiling. Who knows, he could hit form this week and hit that 140 break even. His projected score is 114, which I think is a realistic type score, and will only lose about 10K if you're an owner. If you're a non-owner, you probably don't look to jump on Boak now, but just keep him on your watch list. There may be a stage in the season where it will work out to get him into your side. And Cam Guthrie, never really viewed him as an uber elite midfield premium. 600K though, he's had a really good start to the year with an average of 114, but now finds himself with a break even of 172, looking to lose about 25K this week. Onto the rucks. Now, there's a lot of names there, but there's only a few names worth discussing. Look, if you went with the set and forget strategy at the start of this year, you'd be absolutely wrapped at this stage. Everything's worked out well. However, if you only went with one of the big boys and paired them up with a combo such as a Flynn, Meek, then you've been in trouble the last couple of weeks and may have even suffered a donut because the issue is with lots of these R3 and rookie R2 types is the fact that they've got bad job security. Matty Flynn comes back this week, which does save those owners, particularly from a donut, which we never want to see. But Mummy will come in for a couple of games at some stage during the season. I think he played too well just to not come up for consideration for selection again. So Flinney will be rested again at some stage. I expect that he'll come in for probably at least the next three games. And for people that have him on field, that's fantastic. And for people that have him as R3, which I think is basically everyone that's gone with the set and forget, then that cash generation is going to be extremely handy. The issue is, or the question is, do you keep him up until the buy so we can cover for Grundy or Gorn? That's a possibility. Or else do you cash him out when he gets to that sort of 350, 400 mark if he does get there? That'll be an interesting decision. But Flynn at this stage comes back in and if he goes around the 100 mark, we'll make another 60K. So fantastic for everyone, I think. Mummy, you wouldn't go near him. He's not going to be super coach relevant purely because of the fact that he won't play enough games. But a 130 average was fantastic for him. Hunter, bad job security. Fullerton, the same. Tracy, he's on the bubble. But look at the average, 26. He's not going to be an on-field option. And if he's playing, he's not going to be a loophole either. So I think it's going to be a bit of a wasted trade if you bring Tracy in, even though he's on the bubble. Meek... As we said, bad job security. Campbell, he's on the bubble as well. But if you look at the average of 31, absolutely terrible. Do not look to trade him in. Sean Darcy, he's been scoring pretty well lately. So a three-round average of 108. But you just don't look to go near someone like this. You get Gorn or you get Grundy. And if you've got Gorn and Grundy, you don't even really need to be watching this section of the video. Tom Hickey, really unlucky because that was the other strategy that could have worked out well. If you had have gone with one of Gorn and Grundy and paired them up with Tom Hickey at R2, that could have been a pretty successful strategy up until this point. I'm not too sure how long Hickey's out for, but that's unlucky for Hickey owners. That was a pretty good selection, particularly if you started with him at the beginning of the year. Rob, he's hit some form, so the three-round average is now 116. At one stage, his average was in the 60s after the first couple of games, I think it was. So it's good to see that he's returned some form. And for the few owners that do have him, that's really good that he's repaid the faith for you. But wouldn't look to invest in him. Nank the same. Bit of a pod selection. Nick Nat, no, not at this stage. Red break even anyway. Gorn, now I tell you what, if you've got a break even of 133 and it's in the green, that means you're a bona fide gun. Max Gorn, we said this pre-season, all pre-season, you need to go set and forget and particularly have Max Gorn in your side because he's a captain option each and every week. The first week, we would have been a little bit disappointed if we had Gorn as captain, but every week after that, it's just been superb. And a 170-odd on the weekend for me, 
really made my week and ensured that my score was half respectable, certainly below par, but having Gorn with the big C on him is just a fantastic option to have going in week to week. Laddams, I've bought him back purely because I just wanted to use the peanut symbol again. If you've been following my channel during the last year, you'll know why I think Laddams is a peanut, so do not go near this bloke, absolute muppet. And Brody Grundy, 652,100. The average now, close to 120. Projected scores, 126. Look, the break-even is in the red. I've still got a buy now, though, on him. You'll see two buy nows, Max Gorn and Brody Grundy. They're the only two guys that you will see the buy now symbol on, I think, for the entirety of the year, unless there's a rookie that presents themselves maybe mid-year when we look to downgrade someone like Flynn. But... As I said, not much to say in the rucks apart from your goal should be to get Max Gorn and Brody Grundy into your side ASAP. On to the forwards, 500k plus. The man at the top, Toby Green. I can never really recommend this pick, mainly due to the NDHP policy, but has been in some really good form. Seems like he's thrived when he's been given the captaincy with Cornelio out of the side. A projected score of 120, he'll rise up 10k if you can hit that, but never a fan of the Toby Green selection. I am a massive, massive fan of the Josh Dunkley selection. He's up there with the top performing midfielders of the season, let alone the top forwards. So with an average of 128, get him in as soon as possible. Dusty, been extremely disappointing in my opinion anyway. I did give him a bit of a bake in my round review. To sum it up really quickly, I just think that he's showing off a little bit, a bit of look at me, you know, taunting the opposition, taking a bit too much time and then trying to pull off a really difficult kick. and. We say, oh, it's Dusty. You know, usually we can forgive him for this type of stuff because he does so many things well. He's getting a heap of the pill, but he's absolutely butchering it at the moment. So, Dusty, please just keep it simple, mate. We know how good you are. You know how good you are. Just take the easy option and get us some consistent scores in Supercoach. 109 average, that's mainly come off the first two weeks. From weeks three to five, has not hit the ton. I'm hoping for a big response this week, but a pretty disappointed Dusty Martin owner myself. The issue is with Martin is that there's not a heap of other great options that we can see in our forward line at the moment. And if you are looking for a forward upgrade and you've already got Josh Dunkley, Zeeble, for example, then he may be the next best option. If you can hold off, I would, but if you're desperate, I suppose you can still get him in, but has been underwhelming at the moment. Butters, unfortunately, you do have to sell this bloke. That's extremely disappointing for owners, as we mentioned last week. And while I've been producing the stock market video, news has actually come through that Dangerfield will be out for eight to 10 weeks. So don't take too much notice of those binoculars there in the notes section. He is now 100% a sell. We cannot keep on to Danger for that amount of time. And if you did keep on to him, you'd be extremely disappointed because he missed three weeks, came back last week, was definitely underwhelming, and now he's not going to be back for a long time. So get rid of danger, look for another option. On to the forwards, 250 to 500k. The two players you'll see up the top here, two key forwards for the Swans, Sam Reid and Buddy Franklin. I'm just always going to be worried about their durability. But a three-round average for Reedy, 89 average for Buddy is okay, particularly at their price. But not for me, the risk is way too high. Tommy McDonald wasn't looking great at the start of the season. Had some concerns for him. But he's hit some short-term form. What happens when Brown and Wiedemann come back into the side? I'm not sure how that's going to affect Tommy McDonald. But I wouldn't be sucked in to bringing him in at 383000 Even though he's looking to make close to 50 k if he can go just over the ton. My question's always going to be, is he a keeper? And I'm not sure. I don't think that's going to be the case. The answer is different for Jack Zebo. He's certainly a keeper. I still was questioning this even up until last week, but now I'd almost give it the rubber stamp. Another score of 144 over the weekend. We've talked about him a fair bit over the last month, so I'm not going to continue that. All that I will say is that he's still at a decent price if for some reason you haven't got him in. Three around average of 137 and you're paying up 478. Absolute bargain. So if you haven't got Zebo, you have really, really missed out. Bailey Dale, a bit of a pod selection here. Been playing off halfback. No Daniel in the side, so actually took 63% of the kick-ins over the weekend. High meters gained, nice kicking efficiency, 
but a bit of a risky selection and someone who I don't think is going to be a keeper at this stage. But a three-round average of 103 is fantastic from him. Shy Bolton, really exciting type player. Main concern with him is that it's a bit of a yin-yang, can have those really nice games, then the week after be a little bit too quiet. So at 471,000, I probably want to see a little bit more consistency from him. But with a low break even of 27, he seems like an okay buy if you're looking for a wacky pod. Joey Danaher, great to see him hit form against his old club over the weekend. The week before, I was really concerned with him when he played the Dogs because I was watching him really closely and just not did not sorry get involved in the game. But last week, absolutely superb. Hit the scoreboard, high possession count, spent a bit of time in the ruck and was extremely involved. So if you held on to Joey Danaher, well done. He's got some short-term cash to make. Oscar Allen, geez, I rate this bloke's a pick. I really wanted Brisbane to select him in the draft. Unfortunately, the Eagles took him. I loved his leadership capabilities more than anything else, but an extremely talented type player. Pretty lucky to be in the West Coast setup at the moment when you've got players like Darling and Kennedy that can take away some of the attention from Allen. But as a super coach pick, even though he's got a three-round average of 97, you know how I feel about those taller key forwards. I know for me, but a super tight player. Jarman Impey, I do think that he's still got the potential to be a keeper. A quite a game over the weekend, but it wasn't a disappointing game from him by any stretch of the imagination, and I've still got really high hopes for Jarman Impey. A low break even of 41, still some cash to be made. Nick Hines, really rate this guy as well. Used his pace well off the back line. I thought it was going to be out of Hines and Carl for that half-back position of Destin this year, but Hines taken that with both hands. Performed well, three-round average of 93, season average of 91, so pretty consistent there. Low break even. Again, similar to Impey, is he going to be a keeper? There's a possibility he'll probably finish around Jarman's average, uh, Jarman Impey's average for the season. Up to you. A nice pod, but still probably a little bit too risky for me. Cosy, love watching him. Wouldn't select him on my side. Chad Warner. Now, there's been a little bit of talk about people trading out Warner this week. I can see why, because that 50 in his system will now halt some of that cash generation in the next couple of weeks. But for me, he's such a reliable on-field option. 50's been his worst score for the year, and I'm hoping he can hit the 75 to 80 mark most weeks, or even higher as a bit of a bonus. But yeah, just track how he's going in the next couple of weeks, and then he may be a trade-out option soon. But he'll probably be one of my last trade-outs, I think, at this stage. Things can change, though. And Tommy Atkins, again, there's question marks whether or not he can be a keeper. There's a few quick, you know, you've got Atkins, Hine, Impy types. There's a lot of questions, but there's still a lot of hope with these players. Atkins was disappointing over the weekend, and after watching that performance, you probably think to yourself, there's more question marks than what we previously thought, particularly over the first four weeks. But he's been a great starting selection, Tom Atkins, and hopefully he can bounce back this week, but do have some slight concerns whether or not he can keep this form up for the whole year. I'm not a huge fan of any of the blokes that you see on this page. The first four, Stevenson, Stringer, Wingard, and Phillips. I had the trap symbol on all those guys last week, and I'm still going with it this week. Stevenson, three-round average of 81, Stringer 79. There were a few questions last week I got about whether or not Stringer was a good trade-in option. I did not recommend him, and he scored, I think, a 20-odd over the weekend. So no consistency with Stringer, just not a good selection. Same as Wingard, just too inconsistent. Phillips, he's been a trap, terrible this year, an absolute butcher. Logan McDonald, I think it's time to sell because his break even is all the way up to 93 at the moment. The frustrating thing is you haven't made a heap of cash on him. He was looking really good over the first couple of weeks and looking like he could go to 300 to 350, but that's really slowed down. I think it's probably time to get rid of him now before he leaks too much cash. Tex Walker, pretty much on the chopping block in the next week or two if you don't think he's a keeper. Bit of a concern with his calf at the moment. That may limit his scoring potential for the next couple of weeks anyway. So that's purely your decision. But if you did trade him in just for a quick cash grab, now may be the time to start to look to get him out of your side. Still side bottom. He's been pretty disappointing. But break even of 116, projected score of 85. He's looking to go down about 13K. I'm just keeping him on the watch list. Maybe my last forward upgrade, depending on how things go. Zorko, I've now taken the trap off because his durability, I may have been playing that up a little bit too much, but ill-discipline 
has really affected Zorko's scoring this year. But at 493000 there may be a little bit of value there. And the reason why I've taken the trap off him is the fact that there are simply not many good forward options in the premium range this year. So Zorko, you can get him in if you want, but I still don't recommend it. Lockie Fogarty, break even of 140 now, projected score of 92. He's looking to now go down in price. Three round average of 92, 89 on the season. I've said it the last couple of weeks and I haven't done mass research on the bloke because I'm not interested in bringing him to my side, but I just don't know a lot about this pick. So I can't really recommend it, the Fogarty pick. Jordan Ngoi, get rid of this guy. He's an absolute donut. He's injury prone, does silly things. There's just nothing to like about this pick. You've lost a heap of money on him already, but what's the point of keeping him? I just don't see any signs that he's going to improve that average. And Michael Walters, again, he should be on the chopping block. I just don't like his new role. He's getting older. Frio aren't absolutely flying at the moment. And the next generation is now taking over, you know, your brace or your cherry type. So with a break-even of 163, I'd probably trade Walters this week if you can and just get out of Dodgeville. And last but not least, we'll finish off with the forwards under 250k. Bo McCreary, he's the best buy this week if you're looking for a downgrade in your forward line. Performed pretty well, pies over a few injuries, which bodes well for his job security. Provides some good pressure up forward, tackles, and hits a scoreboard. My only main concern is that if he doesn't kick goals, he may have a lower floor, but certainly the best option this week. Not a must trade in by any stretch of the imagination, but if you are looking for a forward downgrade, Bo McCreary should be your man. Mitch Lewis, not really interested in him. Wouldn't pay 200k myself. Miles Bergman, back on the side, and you'd be happy if you held him. Wouldn't look to trade him in, though. Rose break even, that's in the negatives again, so he'll start to make some rapid cash. Deb Robinson, really talented player who stuck behind the likes of Neil and Lyons, unfortunately, for his preferred position on the inside. He's been starting deep forward at times, which has limited his ceiling, but JS is a bit of a concern. He did smash it up in the resis on the weekend and should be recalled soon. Big, big fan of Deb Robinson. Connor Stone, probably better options elsewhere. Alec Wardman, the ship sailed or wouldn't be bringing him in for close to 150k now. Archie Perkins, as we mentioned before, did line up on Lockie Neal. Think he'll be a player of the future, but at that price, you wouldn't look to bring him in. Anthony Scott, he should make some money again. 61 over the weekend. Much better to see rather than those 20 to 30 type scores. Frederick, we probably wouldn't go near at that price. Brockman, I'm holding personally. If you're desperate to get some money into your side, then you could trading out. But I'm holding. He should make hopefully 50 to 100k if he has a really, really nice game at some stage. But I think he'll certainly be a little bit of a slow burn. Harrison Jones, again, another slow burn. Good job security, though. Braden Campbell, same as last week. If you need to trade out a rookie in your forward line or your midfield, I haven't got the mid-forward status on him there, which I should have had. Same as Paddy Dudd, which we'll talk about in a sec. But he's certainly a trade-out candidate. Coming up against Gold Coast this week, so I'm hoping that he can go a 70 plus. That would be fantastic for his cash. And again, if he goes another sub 50 score, then it's gonna be a struggle to make much more money off Campbell in the short term. And Paddy Dudd, it's not Paddy Dale or Spuddy Dale. I was speaking to Azza a week or two ago about this. So I have changed his name to Paddy Dudd, 210,500. I think that he is a sell. I just don't rate him as a football player. What are you gonna do with him? Are you gonna play him on field? Probably not. So at this stage, most likely, Paddy Dudd is on your bench at 210500 which is just too much, and I would recommend to get him out ASAP. So that's it for this week, guys. Hope that helped in some small way. Good luck with all of your important decisions this week, and I'll see you soon in the next one. Good luck. Cheers. Bye.